Now, Sharam, are you ready? Can we start? Get, get, get this man a seat. Somebody. We'll, we'll get you a seat. You need to be in the room. Then we, then we can start. Leave, leave the door ajar, Alan. We're going to need the fresh air, I think. Well, wow. Who thought, who thought we could do this ever again? Um, those of you who've never been to Green College before, big welcome. Those of you who have been to Green College before but not recently, it's good to have you back. Those of you who live at Green College, wow, we should do this more often. Those of you who do live at Green College, um, well, uh, it's always nice to see you around the place. Um, and aren't we lucky? Aren't we lucky? Aren't we grateful? And aren't we somewhat conscious of our responsibilities living as we do in this Vancouver springtime now again on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people? This is a very special occasion. Um, it's not just the culminating event of the Green College public academic year, a year which began uh, when the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge, Stephen Toop, was out here to give a series of lectures on, among other things, the highly disruptive uh, effects of artificial, artificial intelligence for any understanding of the rule of law. That was in September. This is going to be, in just a moment, the 11th annual Richard V. Erickson lecture. It's a lecture series in memory and in honor of Green College's founding principal, uh, Richard Erickson, who was a truly remarkable scholar, a really wonderful man to know, and did a quite extraordinary job as the founding principal of Green College. And there are people in this room who can testify to that much more eloquently than I can because they lived here at the time and were part of the collaborative enterprise that Richard set in train. Green College could have been all sorts of things. If you go back and look at the founding documents, there was plenty of wiggle room, <laughs> to say the least. Um, that Green College became what it quite quickly did become, and to, to a very large extent, I think it's fair to say, has remained ever since, is very largely to the credit uh, of Richard Erickson. So uh, that's one very good reason every year, just to have a moment uh, to celebrate that achievement. Um, we have with us here this evening, they moved. There they are. Ma Matthew Erickson, Richard's son, and his partner, Samantha. Great to have you here. And Ma Matthew... Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> and Matthew's mum, Diana, I hope, is watching via the live stream from Ottawa and was really looking forward to being here, but was kind of COVID stopped at the airport, um, yeah. caught out by some regulations that I don't think Westjet had really explained um, sufficiently in advance. So anyway, Diana, it's, if you're with us, it's great to have you with us and we miss you um, in any case. Now, AJ Agrawal used to live at Green College, uh, so he knows he's not gonna get an elaborate honorific introduction today. In fact, <laughs> I think he would probably start to gag if I attempted such a thing. So I'm gonna take a slightly different tack. Um, AJ was here at the beginning, 1993, when the first bunch of graduate students and others arrived to see about creating Green College with Principal Richard Erickson, the rest of the Erickson family, and, and others. There are others in this room who were here back then at that exciting time uh, when the water pipes used to burst in the middle of the night and inundate residence rooms, before the legendary Green College Dining Society was even invented and members of the college had to forage for grubs um, in, in the woods around the college. Uh, back in the time when Cecil Green himself, aged what by then 93, was quite likely to drop in just to check on the quality of the construction and uh, the quality of the mines uh, at Green College. Oh, what a time. The stories that are told about it now cannot really be controlled for their veracity. <laughs> um, but I learned something new the other day from one of those other founding members who's here this evening and is in fact a former Erickson lecturer herself, Rhea Beaumont, uh, pianist and composer. She said, did you know, Mark, that the year before Green College opened, AJ and I, along with quite a few others back then, UBC students, were living at what was then the Vancouver School of Theology, the, the, the magnificent fortress-like building up the hill. Uh, so they didn't have very far to come once the membership committee decided that they were fit to live at Green College. Well, as, as people who, who know, Green, uh, know UBC know, the, the Vancouver School of Theology, as it then was, 
has since morphed into the Vancouver School of Economics, which would look like an <laughs> allegorical transformation if it, if it wasn't also so obviously literally true. Um, and the additional thing is, let me tell you, that when Cecil Green, before putting up the money for Green College, endowed the Green visiting professorships at UBC, the only stipulation was that these green visiting professors should not be professors of theology. They could do anything else, <laughs> but please not that. When I was a kid, there was a long running show in the West End of London. No sex, please, were British. <laughs> <laughs> no theology, please. It's Green College. What is that about? Well, take a moment to reflect. Why was theology the queen of the sciences in Western universities for as long as it was, from the beginning of Western universities until well, whenever it was, whenever, whatever it was, ha happened at the University of Berlin, about 1800, happened. And even then, for long afterwards, theology was still the queen of the sciences. Did it have something to do with power and prediction? Theologians, after all, Christian theologians, among others, did then, still do, spend quite a bit of time trying to account for the decisions made by God. The decisions he, if we use that pronoun, made in the past, which as St. Paul already recognized, were pretty unfathomable, and the ones that he might make in the future, which were often really rather hard to predict too. Um, theology, surely, a science to help people who are trying to make decisions about their own lives to understand how what actually happens in their own lives depends on other people's decisions, and maybe a particularly powerful uh, decision maker in particular. We don't spend quite so much time around universities these days doing theology, but it seems that the, the, the task taken on by theology is still one that needs to be tackled. You all know the old joke about the Greek tragedians who couldn't decide to finish their plays, so they brought on a god from the machine. Now we have a machine that has a kind of godlike determining and deciding power in our lives, and um, you know, some of the time we're trying to second guess it. The old mythologies and the theologies were about godlike human beings and gods who behave like human beings. Now, you know, we're all rather preoccupied with human beings um, becoming more like machines and machines that are more and more like human beings. Um, maybe we should really just be talking now about human and non-human machines. I don't know. What would we call this science? Economics? <laughs> <laughs> It's lucky A.J. Agrawal is here. A.J., this is your coach house again. <laughs> you, you know how it works. Thank you for coming. It's great to have you back. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Thank you. I'm sorry, just, just one more thing. If you're watching my live stream, um, this Slido device on the screen, which you'll also find at uh, the college's web page for this talk apparently enables you, if you know what to do with it, to send in questions and comments, which we will pick up um, after the talk. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, is the mic on? Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. First, thank you all for being here. Um, it is. This is really. This is really a, a very special opportunity for me. Uh, to give the Erickson Lecture. Uh, <clears throat> I was a graduate student here uh, at UBC and uh, lived at Green College. Uh, and so I see you know, uh, John Diggins and Hake Ferris and so many people that made the college uh, what it was from uh, before any of us moved in. And, uh, and other students who were here when I was here, uh, Makoto, uh, Irene, uh, Arnie, and uh, and also my two next door neighbors, uh, Sharam and Wing. Uh, so they, uh, one Iranian, one Chinese, both came here to teach each other English. <coughs> uh, and so this is uh, this is really uh, a very a very special uh, opportunity for me. It's also because it's the Richard Erickson lecture. Um, when I was here as a graduate student. I, you know, I loved being at Green College, uh, and Dr. Erickson was the boss, 
but I didn't, you know, I didn't really appreciate uh, what he must have done to create the environment that he did. And you know, now I'm a professor. Uh, I'm a full professor at the University of Toronto. And now I realize what he must have done in order to create the environment that he created at Green College. Um, that doesn't happen by itself. And when Mark was describing the wiggle room, uh, I can imagine all the different ways that this college could have uh, evolved. And whatever decisions he made, uh, uh, you know, were, were, you know, he created a magical place. <clears throat> and one of the things that we are missing in academe is cross-disciplinary um, research and inquiry. The you know, universities are, are, are really uh, very unique environments where you get to, you get to pursue your curiosity. Uh, there are very few other occupations where you really get to do that. Uh, except that at universities, it is very disciplinary oriented. I, I know that it's fashionable to talk about multidisciplinary, but very few places actually do it. And, uh, but this was, a, this was a place that did. And so and Dr. Erickson brought that to life. So uh, today, I'm, the topic I'm talking about um, is uh, draws upon economics, statistics, uh, and computer science, and it's uh, machine intelligence. I'm going to touch on three themes. Uh, the first is to lay out some groundwork for uh, what I think are important ideas, uh, and then I will build on those ideas uh, to make the second two points. Uh, the, the, the two waves point is going to be, you know, there's been a lot of um, excitement around artificial intelligence. And for many people now that, you know, that started around 2014, 2015, depending on, on um, you know, the, the people's uh, characterization of, of when uh, deep learning and reinforcement learning uh, really entered the mainstream. Uh, but to some extent, there has been a, a sense of, of disappointment that uh, this was going to this was going to make a lot of things better, and, and uh, it has some things, uh, but many other things seem much less impacted than what we thought. Uh, the last point I'm going to make has to do with power, which is I think we are just uh, beginning to see the very first signs of what this technology uh, may bring, and the responsibility we have to uh, manage it. Okay, <clears throat> so let me begin the foundations and the first point here about decision making. And effectively what I'm just going to describe is the ingredients that are the what I would view as the primary ingredients to decision making. And the reason you know decision making is important is because everything we do is riddled with decision making. Uh, at, at work, at home, uh, in, in business, in government, uh, we just can't get a, away from decisions. And so, <clears throat> in decision theory, um, decision making is largely characterized by these two elements. Uh, one is the uh, probabilities, and the second is consequences. And so, if we take a simple decision, like imagine that you are uh, living in Vancouver and about to go outside, and the sky's a little gray, and you're making a decision of whether to take an umbrella. <clears throat> if you even give it a second's thought, you might think, okay, if I take an umbrella, then I'm safe. Effectively, umbrella is a type of insurance. Uh, that if there's a, the bad outcome, which is rain, uh, I'll stay dry. Uh, if I leave the umbrella, then uh, I'm, I'm unburdened. So the benefit of that is I don't have to carry the thing around. Uh, but of course, if it rains, I'll get wet. And so if we even give it that much thought, uh, we do a quick assessment and then decide whether to grab the umbrella or not. What is happening under the hood? One way to think about, uh, just to put a bit of structure behind that decision, is it's got an element of uncertainty. And the uncertainty is, uh, will, will it rain or be sunny? And then it's got a consequence, an outcome. Uh, and either we're going to be dry or wet. <clears throat> In order to make a decision 
of whether you're going to take your umbrella, uh, we need to know two things. What's the probability of rain or sun? And then what is the consequence of being dry or wet? Uh, and these values that I've put here uh, of, of dry or wet, you could imagine that uh, the default is I take an umbrella and either way I'm dry. Uh, if I don't take the umbrella, I've got this penalty. Uh, I look at dislike being wet. And if I uh, leave the umbrella and it's sunny, then I'm unburdened with, uh, I don't have to carry around the umbrella. So I've got a higher payoff than if I were to have to carry it around. Uh, and what's interesting here is that stuff in the blue, uh, it would likely be different for every person in the room. And that's going to become important soon. Because that is the part of uh, what we call judgment and being human, in the sense that everybody has different preferences. We all face the same probabilities, potentially. In other words, uh, depending on whether we're making the probability assessment or, let's say, the, the weather station's making that, that prediction. Uh, but we are assigning the values <clears throat> in the blue. So I won't go through the arithmetic, but uh, those that are interested, uh, the way we solve this is uh, in deciding whether to take the umbrella or to leave the umbrella is we take the probabilities times the outcomes, and we're left with a, uh, you can think of it as a score. In this case, uh, the score is higher for, for leaving the umbrella than it is for taking the umbrella, so we would choose to leave the umbrella and go without it. If instead the probability of rain in this example was 30% rather than 25%, then the decision flips. And so if it, in this particular case, if, if it, we just increase the probability by a small amount, we would change our decision. Uh, the optimal decision would become to take the umbrella. So, But the key point here is that there's two ingredients to making a decision, a probability and a judgment. And most of the time, we go around and we're making all kinds of decisions, and uh, we are doing that assessment either consciously or subconsciously. Uh, but we are, we are making some form of a, a probability assessment and a judgment assessment, uh, whether we realize it or not when we're making a decision. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to skip through a couple of these things here since the audio is not working. Um, okay. So that's point number one, prediction and judgment. Here's point number two. From an economist's point of view, what is uh, artificial intelligence? We think of the rise of AI as being characterized as a drop in the cost of prediction. And the, my book, Prediction Machines, uh, co-authored with Avi Goldfarb and Joshua Gans, is effectively starts off at this point, that the economist view of AI, which is basically just statistical prediction, is that as AI gets better and better, it effectively makes prediction cheaper and cheaper. So well, if you were to ask uh, a computer scientist or an electrical engineer, say, you know what, I keep reading about AI, what's going on in the field of AI? They might have an image like this in their head and they'll talk to you about advances in neural networks. But if you ask an economist what's going on with AI, they won't have this image in their head, they'll have this image. And the reason for an economist that AI is so foundational is because the thing for which the cost is falling is such a foundational input, and that thing is prediction. Because we use prediction everywhere. Where do we use prediction? In decision making. So we've got this technology that makes this thing cheaper, and the thing that's being cheaper is foundational into decision making. <clears throat> and prediction is embedded in all kinds of things where you might not think of prediction. So, for example, driving. When you hear about uh, artificial intelligence and autonomous driving, that's effectively prediction. Uh, which is, you know, when you think of uh, us drive, the way they train an AI to drive a car in a very simplistic characterization is that, you know, they put a human behind the wheel and they drive and think of, imagine an AI sitting in the passenger seat. As we're driving, we have data coming in through our eyes and our ears. We're processing the data with our monkey brains. And then we take an action. And the actions are very simple. Left, right, brake, accelerate. That's all we do. So we have data in, process, and we take an action. The AI doesn't have our eyes and ears, so we give it its own data inputs, radar, LIDAR, cameras around the car. 
and then uh, the as the car is driving, the AI, you can think of it as every second it's trying to predict what will the human driver do next. I think she'll go straight. I think she'll break. Uh, and a second later, the AI finds out, was it right? And so it's got a model, a prediction model. Every second it's predicting what the human driver would do. Every time it's correct, it reinforces its model. Every time it's, it's wrong, uh, the, the mo uh, they update the model. AI updates its model. Okay, same with translation. When you and I uh, you know, learn to translate, the AI is not learning to translate the way we do. The AI doesn't understand anything. Effectively, the way the translation works is it turns into a prediction problem. We feed the AI pairs of translated documents. Chihiro. The AIs are doing, she, says she translates. Uh, pairs of, tra uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of professionally translated documents. And then when we give the AI, a, let's say, a, a paragraph in English that it's never seen before, it predicts what would that paragraph look like in Japanese or French or Spanish. Uh, so it turns translation, doesn't understand anything, turns it into a prediction problem. Uh, Sharam Tafazli is sitting here, has built the AI that does this one in the corner, which is uh, it predicts the, effectively the edge of the rocks on a belt in the mining industry. So rather than a human having to go and measure, for example, for, for measuring fragmentation, which is very important if, of knowing the, the extent, the amount of fragmentation of rocks as, as uh, the material is pro goes through the processing um, <clears throat> process, uh, that now we can just put a camera, the camera is taking an image, and AI is predicting what's the edge of each rock, so it can then measure uh, what are the size uh, of the particles. Replying to your email. Uh, most people don't think of replying to their email as a prediction problem. But if you use a smart email client, like uh, Google email or something, you hit reply, and it gives you those three suggestions at the bottom, that's the AI has predicted how you may want to respond. And every time you pick one of those three responses, you are further training the AI. The AI. Okay. So, <clears throat> what's happening here is as this new statistical technique, machine learning, um, is applied to more and more domains. We, we're taking a thing that we always used to do together that was coupled in our brain, the prediction and the judgment, and we decouple them. So we start outsourcing the prediction part to the machine. So if you th think back to that decision tree of taking an umbrella, if, if we look outside, we make a quick assessment, we predict what's the likelihood of rain, and then we apply our judgment, how much do we care if we get wet, that in all these kinds of decisions, we can start outsourcing the prediction part to the machine. And that's going to, just that decoupling, you can think of it like splitting an atom, it is going to be the, the foundation of a whole bunch of transformations through the economy. I'm, I'm going to walk through those in a minute. But the, but the essence is this point, the decoupling point. There's one other thing about the AIs uh, being predictors, is they are arguably the first tool in human history that learns as you use it. Um, and so the more you use it, the smarter it gets. Uh, because every time you, you use it and then it makes a prediction and then you find out whether the prediction was correct or not, uh, it can update the model. And furthermore, uh, <clears throat> in terms of the implications of that in a market sense from the you know, economist's point of view, uh, we start getting concentration. Because we, when once, one, imagine, imagine a, six university teams all building AIs to, to do early detection of breast cancer. Imagine that's the prediction. So they're all working away, doing the, working on this prediction, and then one team gets a little ahead of the others. Now all the docs who are uh, using these AIs say, wait a minute, um, the, the ones who are using any of the other five AIs, and why are we using this AI? Let's use the better AI. And so some of the docs move over and start using this one, and now there's more docs using this, and with more docs using it, it generates more data. With more data, that gets better predictions, and now the gap gets even bigger. 
the more that you, the more people that use it, the more data that gets generated, the more data that gets generated, the better the predictions. And so it just, the gap keeps growing. And because unlike, you know, in, in normal uh, brick and mortar type of, of goods and services, uh, if you have a high quality thing and a low quality thing, they can coexist because of price. You can have different prices. So you can go down, uh, you know, downtown in Vancouver, and there'll be a, a Starbucks in one corner, and a, and, a, and like another coffee shop, uh, let's say a Tim Hortons or something, another coffee sh uh, corner, and they can both be right beside each other. Because if you want to pay, you know, seven bucks for a latte or two bucks for a coffee, uh, you can choose. But when everything's free, who wants to use the second best? Uh, <clears throat> So uh, many of you will recognize these two uh, from a garage in, in uh, Mountain View, California. And when they started their business, nobody would have guessed uh, that they would effectively monopolize the market for information. And so when you go to Google, for example, and you type in your query into Google, and you hit uh, enter, and Google is uses their AI, probably the most powerful AI in the world, to make a prediction out of all the different websites, which are the ones that would be most likely to provide the information that you're looking for. And so it serves you up 10, 10 links. And here's the magical part. You click on one. Because when you click on one, let's say you click on the sixth link. The AI says, oops, we made a mistake. We thought that was the sixth best, but you just told us it was the best. It updates this model. So every one of us who uses Google, we are all working for Google, training their AI. Every time you click, you're training their AI. You're telling them which of the links is the best match for the character. Remember, Google doesn't understand anything. It just gets the character string and then predicts the link. But the point is, it's learning. It's getting better and better. That's why even you know, during the course of this lecture, uh, they'll think of all the new content that's going to come online. Uh, the new New York Times articles and the, the cat videos on YouTube and all this stuff. And yet Google will, will very quickly uh, figure out you know, uh, how relevant those are to different searches because we are all working to train it. So it's just it's very hard to imagine a world where these machine predictions don't get so much better than what any human can possibly do. Uh, this is Vinod Khosla. He's one of the most prolific in, in, in investors in machine intelligence in the world. He was visiting Toronto um, a couple of few years ago. And he made the point, any radiologist who plans to practice in 10 years will be killing patients every day. It will only be their arrogance that lets them practice because it would be criminal. They would be misdiagnosing much more than normal systems. And what he means by normal systems is AI systems. Because effect effectively, uh, diagnosis is a prediction problem. Medical diagnosis is a prediction problem. <clears throat> Last point here on learning is I'm not sure who's going to win the race uh, to build the, the first fully autonomous vehicle. You know, Tesla thinks uh, it'll be them because they've got, you know, even if you don't have autopilot on, anytime you're driving a Tesla, they're collecting all your driving data. And so they can train on real data rather than sim, sim data or simulated data. I'm not sure who will win. But one thing's almost surely true. Once somebody gets over the line and you're now allowed to take your hands off the wheel and have the car uh, drive around the city, and then it's learning as it drives. As the second car gets over the line, I'm not sure you know, which policymaker in Washington is going to stand up and say, yes, and it's OK for everyone to drive the second best AI. Who's going to want to drive in the second best AI when the first is It's just software, so it doesn't cost anymore to drive the best. So the, this, the way it learns leads to monopoly power. OK, that's point number two. Uh, here's the, the third foundational point, is that when something becomes cheaper, especially when that thing that's becoming cheaper is a general purpose technology, 
by general purpose, I mean it can be applied in many different domains. That um, it can have an effect when it's applied as a point solution. And you can think of, I'll explain what point solution is in a minute, but you think of it as a very kind of specific prediction, in our case, prediction problem. But it can have a much bigger effect when it's applied and it impacts an entire system. And this point about system is I've just, uh, I've just finished a new uh, a book on, on this topic, and it's, it's all about this system point. Let me explain what it is. <clears throat> um, in the late 1800s, uh, when electricity was invented, the primary benefit of electricity was initially characterized as lowering energy costs. So, for example, rather than burning uh, oil in a lamp, um, or if, for example, in a factory uh, that was being powered by steam uh, or, or some you know, hydro, water or some energy source, that would, to bring it into the factory, you can think of effectively, you know, the power would be turning a crank, the crank would be turning a shaft, there should be like a big uh, steel shaft coming into a factory. And it would require all kinds of you know, heavy-duty bracing and support to, to support the, these shafts that would come in. And uh, you would lose a lot of energy due to friction. And so the idea in the beginning of electricity was, oh, uh, it, will, it will lower these costs because you won't have these friction costs. Um, the co this, co this energy cost was lower. This is the adoption of electricity. Um, the blue and orange is factories and the gray and yellow is uh, in, in homes uh, in, in the last decade of the 1800s. <clears throat> and you can think of that as, uh, you, I'm going to make the connection here to another general purpose technology, uh, machine intelligence, uh, that we are in that first decade. Uh, if we think of the modern AI as a result of, um, of advances in machine learning, uh, we, you know, we're, we're roughly in the first decade. Then here's what happened. So they started off, if you think of the entrepreneurs selling electricity, what, what in the business today we would call their value proposition was lower energy costs. Now, if you already had your factory set up and you were operating... Uh, very few wanted to pull out their existing, uh, their existing power source and wire in this electricity. So the main customers were people building new factories. As they started to implement this new source of energy, of power, they started discovering a few other things. They said, wait a minute. Because we don't have to have those big steel shafts coming into the factory, we can have much lighter weight construction because they needed so much structural um, support to carry those big steel uh, uh, rods, shafts, that uh, the entire building had to be designed to, uh, you know, to carry that kind of a load. So they can have a much lighter weight construction. Secondly, in order to keep those heavy uh, steel shafts as short as possible, they would put all the machinery right up against the wall so they didn't have to be so long. And furthermore, they would then build the factories vertically so that everything could be up against the wall. Once they realized with electricity they didn't, that, they were, that was relaxing the constraint, they not only went to lighter weight construction, they could put everything on one level. And once they put everything on one level, they realize, wait a minute, we can start reorganizing the, the, the workflow and have a much more efficient uh, workflow movement of people and, and materials. And furthermore, because we are not all uh, powering the machines off the single shaft, before what would happen is when one machine would break down, all the machines would stop. Now each one got a, a, its own power source. So one machine would go down, and this would happen reasonably frequently. Machine would go down, all the other machines could keep operating. 
So eventually they realized, wait a minute, electricity is delivering way more than just the drop in energy cost. It has enabled an entire redesign of the factory. The real benefit is it has enabled decoupling the power source from the machine. The machines can now go anywhere. And that can lead to you know, change in the construction and the rest of it. So what happened in the first 10 years when what they thought was the benefit was lower cost, I've drawn the pink line is if, you know, if we just kept a linear extrapolation of what the adoption would have looked like over time. But that's not what happened. Because they started to realize how they could do the redesign, how they would change not just the, the power source, but change the system. And it looked like that. Okay, so those are the three foundational points. Now let me take them into uh, what we're seeing now in machine intelligence. So the first part is like electricity, the adoption of AI seems to be happening in two waves. If you think of this thing here, um, you know, this being wave one and then this being wave two, uh, what we're seeing in machine intelligence, we think, uh, we think we are on the brink of a wave two. Uh, <clears throat> let me, I'm, I'm going to wind the tape back a bit here to tell you when we first started to realize that our thinking about AI uh, had missed this very central point of the amplification of the impact once you apply it to systems. So we hosted this conference in Toronto in 2017 and uh, the Prime Minister uh, came to it and he was talking at that time about the uh, industrial strategy of Canada and having AI clusters and um, and you know his idea was you know, we would concentrate activity in certain areas. And if he had asked us at that time, which Canadian city will produce the first AI unicorn? Uh, unicorn meaning you know a startup that that reaches a billion dollar valuation. Uh, these are my two co-authors. Uh, what we would have said would be probably Toronto, maybe Montreal, possibly Edmonton. And the reason for that was. At that time, the three leading lights in the field was a professor named Jeff Hinton at Toronto, Yasha Benjo at Montreal, and um, uh, Rich Sutton at the University of Alberta, uh, who pioneered, the, the first two were working in deep learning, and Rich Sutton pioneered a, a field called uh, reinforcement learning. And, and because they were there, uh, all the you know all the graduate students and everybody who was sort of in the know in this area was all were all flocking to these three cities. If he would have said, "How confident are you?" we would have said, "We're pretty confident," um, and we would have felt reasonably you know confident in our assessment. We'd done a lot of things. Um, we you know we'd written done some research. We'd written this book. We'd written and published a number of es essays on in this field. Uh, we had um, co-edited what's become the primary uh, reference for PhD students in economics of AI. Uh, we founded a program called the Creative Destruction Lab, uh, where at, at that time, I think, as far as we know, we had uh, more AI startups than any other program in the world. Um, we'd worked, served on policy, various policy circles and things. Uh, this is an example of one. Um, Along there, Eric Lander was subsequently appointed the chief scientist uh, by President Biden for the U.S. government. Ashton Carr is a former uh, Secretary of Defense. Uh, John Hennessy is the uh, chairman of Alphabet Google. Um, you know, we were doing these types of things, and so we thought we had a pretty good sense of what was happening in AI. Uh, and we knew that in Toronto, Montreal, were these uh, Turing Award winners, which in computer science, that's the equivalent of the Nobel Prize. Um, and uh, the government we knew was going to be channeling a lot of funding to those three cities. Uh, companies were, were piling into those three cities to set up their AI labs, uh, the ones that are listed here. And, uh, this was all was happening in 2017. So that's why we would have picked those. Um, and, and we would have been wrong. And not a little wrong, um, a lot wrong because if, if someone had said no you're wrong it's not going to be one of those three cities then we would have said oh well then it's probably Vancouver or Calgary we would have listed what we thought would, would be the next hubs where there were uh, people in computer science working in related fields 
Um, so if it wasn't to come from one of those places, where would it come from? If any of you have seen <clears throat> come from away, uh, you know, that's, yes, you have. Uh, that's, that's where, uh, you know, this, the first AI unicorn came from St. John's, Newfoundland. And um, for those who haven't been to St. John's, it's, you know, it's not on the, the tech <laughs> flight path. Um, <clears throat> and yet, that's where it came from. And uh, the company was called Verifin. And now, knowing what we know, as we've seen how this field has, the economics of this field have developed, looking back, it was obvious. And the reason is because of the point I made at the beginning of the lecture of decoupling. Here's why. We were looking at all the wrong things. We were looking uh, at the supply side. We were looking at, okay, where are the superstars in computer science that are focused on machine learning? And they were at the places I've just described. What we should have been looking at is where are people applying prediction where the prediction has already been decoupled from judgment? Because the decoupling is hard. In other words, um, it, it leads to organizational change, and that's really hard. And if we would have done that, here's what we would have noticed. If we would have just, instead of p paying attention to where are the computer science rock stars, we would have said, first of all, which businesses have the, uh, the greatest amount of data scientists already working there? One, of the, you know, one industry that would be up near the top, uh, if not at the top, is the financial institutions, the banks. The banks have armies of data scientists. And they were already doing predictive analytics. They were already had separated prediction and judgment, and they were doing all these prediction jobs on things like fraud detection, anti-money laundering, know your customer, sanction screening. They had teams of data scientists doing predictions. Then if we would have asked, okay, who are the startups that are working on those problems for the banks, there was only about half a dozen of them. And one of them was called Verifin, and it was in St. John's, Newfoundland. So if we had instead looked at who has, who's working on a problem that's already been decoupled, we would have been much more likely to get to the right answer. <clears throat> okay, so Verifin is not an isolated in, in, incident. It's part of a pattern. Um, in that same year, we... Uh, we organized this conference uh, where we invited some of the world's top economists to come to Toronto um, to weigh in on the e economics of AI in their field. So no, at this time in 2017, no, there was no economists that were really focused on machine intelligence. But the, you know, we, So we took people who were superstars in their field, like in education or tax or public health, and we, we invited them to come to Toronto and say, okay, we, we need you to think through what's AI going to do in your field with respect to economics. The first, uh, the, and then we published this book. Uh, the first chapter, the first presentation was by um, this team from Stanford, uh, Penn, and Chicago. And they presented this paper, Artificial Intelligence and the Modern Productivity Paradox, A Clash of Expectations and Statistics. And here was their key point. They said, look, we live in an age of paradox that on the one hand, AI is amazing. It's surpassing human ability on all these different tasks. On the other hand, measured productivity growth has declined by half over the past decade and real income has stagnated since the late 1990s. Uh, so effectively, they're saying, what's going on? How, how can these two things coexist? How can we have this amazing technology on the one hand and, and slowing productivity growth on the other? And they pointed back to a uh, Nobel laureate uh, MIT professor, Robert Solow, who said, you can see the computer, uh, computer age everywhere but in the productivity statistics. And they said, uh, you know, m we think we're in the same situation here, where that was a time where uh, we expected to see uh, big productivity gains due to the, the uh, rolling out of computers, and they weren't showing up. 
And so, and in their paper, they showed, you know, the, the obligatory, uh, there's a professor named Fei-Fei Li, she runs uh, the AI, AI lab at Stanford, and she ran a contest called ImageNet, and that blue line is um, uh, the percentage of errors that AIs make in recognizing image, and the yellow line's human, and every year they'd run this contest, and the best teams from around the world would fly to Stanford and, and uh, you know, deploy their AIs, and they would compete, and what you're, that blue line is the winning team. And so each year the winning team was getting better and better. That big drop is the year that uh, uh, Jeff Hinton's team from Toronto uh, rolled into Palo Alto with their with the new approach called deep learning, and then it just kept uh, going and and they eventually finished the contest because the AIs had uh, more or less just solved the problem. And then he compared that to this. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, labor productivity growth. And he was focused here on the last, basically the last 10 years of the graph where all the lines are going down. Uh, the point being that productivity growth is slowing. Meanwhile, over out of academe and in the business world, we had companies like McKinsey doing surveys, uh, this survey of uh, over 2,000 large companies. And they're asking about uh, what they're doing in AI. And they find you know, half the companies are, uh, are adopting AI, but a very small percentage are actually finding any benefit from it. So lots are doing stuff in AI, and a very small fraction are actually benefiting. Uh, Forbes write this story about all the money companies are going to spend on AI, um, but with little return. And um, MIT and the Boston Consulting Group did a survey, and they found only 10% of the large companies they surveyed were actually getting a return on their AI investment. So going back to the, the study, this a clash of expectations, the authors say, you know, why could this, why is it, what's going on? They said, well, maybe it's just false hopes that, you know, we are expecting something from this technology that's just not going to happen. Maybe it's mismeasurement. Maybe it's happening, but we're just not capturing it in the data. Maybe it's, it's just redistribution, meaning uh, that we're, we're not getting more productive. It's just one company uh, winning the business from another. Or maybe it's coming and it's an implementation lag. And they go through a fair amount of statistical exercises and they end up with uh, coming to the conclusion that they think is number four, uh, the implementation lag. And so <clears throat> if you think about the first wave in electricity where the idea was just uh, cheaper energy, uh, that is largely what we've seen so far in, in uh, AI, similar thing, where it's been the application of solving prediction problems where prediction has already been decoupled from judgment. What's coming now, the next wave, are, are the, think of it, you know, the, the image to have in your mind is the factory redesign. So that is just beginning, where the deployment of AI leading to the decoupling of prediction and judgment and that can, uh, I'm going to give you some examples in a moment, uh, lead to a, 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 the type of redesign that takes significant time and capital uh, investment to, to facilitate. And this, I just find this interesting. There are, these are all articles that uh, where people, not for the same reason that I've just done, but have compared AI to electricity because um, of its general, general application. Okay. <clears throat> So why does it take so? Why does why does this second wave take so long? One is uh, you know the the sort of structural change that I've described that's similar to the factory. Here's another one. The reason prediction is valuable is because it's a way of managing uncertainty. And think about all the businesses. What have they been doing before AI? Somehow they, that uncertainty is out in the world. Somehow they've had to deal with it. And so they have built up all kinds of things to manage the uncertainty. And the, and the sort of mental image you can have in your mind is basically sweeping it under the rug. So putting things in place to hide the uncertainty so we don't have to deal with it. Here's an example, a, a sort of a nice one to have in the back of your mind. Airports. Airports... Um, are effectively a monument to uncertainty. 
Think of every time you fly, how much time you spend you, uh, getting, you know, getting to the airport way before you need to because of all the uncertainty associated uh, with the airport. And what's remarkable about this, if, you're, if you think to yourself, well, really, is that really uncertainty? Here is the litmus test. How many times do you get to see Gucci and Prada and you know, these types of retail outlets, okay, for the regular people when the very wealthy people get this? Okay, so this is what the lounge looks like if you fly on a private jet out of Toronto and most places. Why does this not look fancy? How come they get just a, a you know a cappuccino maker and, a, and a, a small fridge with a bottle of water and the regular people get Prada? Because these people don't have to wait. They just arrive, walk out of their car, climb on their plane, and fly. All that other stuff is there to entertain us because we have to wait. And we're waiting because of uncertainty. If you don't have uncertainty, you don't need to wait. <clears throat> okay, here's another way of managing uncertainty. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm describing these to you so that you can get a sense of all the, the, the infrastructure that we put in place to hide the uncertainty. And that's why it's, it takes so much time in order to ultimately benefit from the, like the infrastructure changes that will be enabled by this uh, prediction technology. <clears throat> Let me skip through these. Okay, AI didn't save us from COVID, but it could have. Okay, it could have. And here's why. When COVID arrived... Virtually the entire world characterized COVID as a health problem. They said, this is a health crisis. Depending on where you were at which, you know, which place, let's say the infection rate was one in a thousand. In some places it was one in 3,000, one in 4,000. Let's say one in one in a thousand. For the one person out of a thousand that was infected, COVID really was a health problem. For the other 999, there was no health problem. People were fine. They were not infected. They were, uh, they were healthy as could be. For everybody else, it was an information problem. It was an information problem because because we because we didn't have the information of who the one person was that was infected, we had to treat everybody like they could be infected. And that's what shut down the world economy. What shut down the world economy wasn't COVID. It was information. In the absence of the information, we had to treat everybody like they could be infected. So that's why it is effectively a prediction, because it was an uncertainty because we had the uncertainty. So there are all kinds of various prediction technologies that uh, had been put forward for predicting the likelihood that somebody was infected. In fact, it, being infected didn't even really matter. What mattered from a public health perspective was infectious. And so if you could predict who was infectious, then the last two years wouldn't have happened. And there's just one after the other uh, thing. So all of, because we didn't have prediction, we used rules. We said, okay, all the stores must close. Everybody must social distance. Everybody must wear a mask. All that stuff, we used rules because we didn't have prediction that would have enabled a decision. And arguably, those rules were very expensive from a mental health perspective, a financial perspective, from so many different perspectives, those one-size-fits-all rules were wickedly expensive. So imagine you could do prediction. Um, 
this is one I actually have spent a lot of time thinking about. <clears throat> uh, I founded, along with some colleagues, what became the largest rapid testing program in Canada. Uh, it was called the CDL Rapid Screening Consortium. And we use rapid antigen tests because our thesis was if, if COVID is an information problem, then the best, fastest, cheapest way to solve the information problem is to do a test. We actually, in the summer of, of um, 2020, we put together a, uh, we called it the Vision Council, and it was a, a group of uh, CEOs and thought leaders, Mark Carney and uh, Chris Hatfield and uh, a, about a dozen or so CEOs, and one of the people in our group was Margaret Atwood. And Margaret Atwood said, wouldn't it be great if we had something like a pregnancy test, like a pee on a stick test that you could just quickly tell somebody was infected? And that was before rapid, rapid tests had become a thing. Um, and so we ended up with the rapid test. This is a graph of, uh, once we launched this program, the number of different companies that uh, joined. The, the idea was that we would use uh, information. These tests, they're not perfect. They make predictions. You use them to make predictions of who's infected. Number of companies that join the, uh, the system from coast to coast. But what we learned in the process was just having the prediction wasn't enough. You had to build a whole system around it. So, like in other words, what happened when someone uh, tested positive? What would you know? In other words, what were the rules? How long did they have to stay home? Did they still get paid? All that stuff. The prediction by itself wasn't enough. It had to be part of a system. And so, what took so long in getting this uh, going was not the the prediction part. It was the system part. We ended up publishing this paper um, that described this rapid antigen testing and, and describing the system. Okay. Let me move to the last part here, which is what has all this got to do with power? How does, uh, how do these, uh, in, inserting this predict technology into an economic system impact power? So the first thing here is a way that it changes power is by changing who gets to make decisions. Here's an example. Lead pipes. Lead pipes are a problem. <clears throat> and uh, in Michigan, they had a uh, change in their water system, and that led to a spike in lead in the drinking water. A team at the University of Michigan built an AI. And what the job of that AI was, was to predict which pipes under the ground were lead. And so they built this AI, uh, they deployed it, and 80% of the times that they predicted a pipe was lead, when they would actually dig in and pull out the pipe, they would find, yep, it's correct, it's a lead pipe. So they uh, replaced a number of these pipes. Uh, but as they were doing this work, it started to become political. And some influential uh, residents of Flint went to the city council and said, how come our pipes are, are, are not being pulled out? In other words, you know, they could only do a, a certain number at a time, and they felt that uh, they were waiting too long. So they ended up dispensing with the AI and replaced it with a project manager who would decide where they would dig out the pipes. <clears throat> this is a map of the, um, of the pipes uh, in the different parts of Flint. The ones that are blue were not lead, and the ones that were red were lead. And so those three boxes that I've circled in, uh, or put the red box around, those were wards in the city uh, where the uh, project manager said to dig. So in other words, uh, the, the, um, the color of the pipe on this, on this chart are ones that were, are verified. In other words, they were dug up, and so we know whether they were lead or not lead. And <clears throat> what you can see is that the project manager had pointed the excavators to dig in areas that were far less likely uh, to have lead pipes. 
Now, in March of 2019, a U.S. court approved a settlement that required the city to go back to using the AI. So the court removed the political discretion. It shifted power away from the city council and the project managers. And effectively, uh, what the court did was by saying to use the AI, remember, all the AI does is prediction. It doesn't do judgment. But the implication by saying follow the AI meant that the, the judgment, those numbers that were on the, on the blue, on the right-hand side of the tree, the decision tree, meant every home is equal. By saying, if you're, if you're just going to follow the prediction, there's no weighting that's happening on the right-hand side. And so it was a shift in power. Removed discretion, replaced it with prediction. Because when those things are coupled, you don't know what's happening in a person's mind, what part of their decision to dig here is because they're of the prediction part, because they think, oh, it's more likely there's a lead pipe here, or the judgment part, which is I put more value on uh, checking here. So by decoupling, it, it led to a shift uh, in power. Here's another way to, uh, an, another type of power shift that results from bringing the AI into the environment. So think of uh, home insurance. Insurance more or less hasn't changed in 75 years. And think how crazy that is. Like today, if you're an 18-year-old male, you will pay a higher premium for car insurance than a 40-year-old female, regardless of how you drive. Meanwhile, Elon can tell the difference between how aggressively Hague breaks and I break, and how closely he tailgates versus me. And so in other words, think of the difference in the fidelity of the prediction. Elon can predict who is more likely to have an accident. And furthermore, if on a particular day I'm more likely if I'm driving more aggressively uh, than somebody else. And yet, the insurance industry is still pricing on extremely crude level predictions. Now in home insurance, the primary service that home insurance provides to society is the pooling and the transfer of risk. Okay, so in other words, the pooling, so imagine just a very simplistic idea. Imagine a village with 100 homes. Uh, you know, one home catches fire, it burns down, catastrophic loss, person loses everything. So what, they, what the homes could do is they could decide in advance, let's all chip in and put some money in a pot. If, any, if anyone's home uh, has some catastrophic event, then they can have the pot of money. Okay, that's pooling risk. Then along comes the insurance company and says, rather than you needing to pool amongst yourselves, uh, we'll do that for you. And so you can transfer the risk to us. You'll pay a premium. Uh, your, your insurance premium, and, and then we'll take on the risk. Okay, so that's where the insurance, in, that, that was the invention of the insurance industry, and it hasn't changed. Now think about how crazy this is. Imagine going to the doctor, and you sit down, uh, and the doctor does an, ex an examination of you. Does all the exam, does all the stuff, and at the end of the medical exam says, I think you're going to be really sick in three years. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs> and you'd be saying, wait a minute. If you've just examined me and you know I'm going to be sick in three years, what, tell me what it is and what can I do? Now, that, if I were to tell you that in a medical setting, you would think that's absurd. No doctor would ever do that. Yet that's exactly what the insurance industry does every day. They have all this data. They predict the risk, let's say, of a fire or of, a, of a, a flood in your house. They know the risk. They might know that the risk of, uh, of, of some kind of uh, claim due to, let's say, a flood in my house is much higher than in Wing's house. And they use that information to price the risk. But they never tell me why. 
They never tell me, oh, you're getting a higher premium because you're, you're likely to have a flood. They just send me the, the, the premium. So there are these, uh, all of these tools now. As the cost of sensors falls, as uh, and the sensors collect data, and that data, AIs use the data to make predictions. So this is, for example, one uh, ting that uh, is used to um, predict electrical fires. So you just, you just plug it into your, into your wall socket, and you plug a few of them around your house, and it and it sends a message to your app, to your app, and also if you want to your insurer that says if you're uh, at an, something happens and you're in an elevated risk of a house fire. Now imagine if an insurance industry, if an insurance company knows that you're more likely to have a house fire, it's in their interest to lower the risk for you. In other words, they pool risk, they transfer risk but they don't do mitigation of risk. But they could. They know more about the risks of my house than I do. This is the same thing of a sensor that does exactly the same thing, but for flooding, what they call water non-weather. That means leaky pipes. Why don't they do this today? Why doesn't an insurance firm, and I know like a few do a little bit dabble here and there, but they, are, they do so little risk mitigation. Why? Because all the agents have incentives to sell high premium. They don't want to give you a device that will lower your premium. It's not in their interest. It, this is a, an incentive problem that requires to really leverage the prediction a change in the system. It's a system. And it's, it's going to happen. There are all these startups that are nip it, you know, nipping at the heels of the insurance companies. In the business, they call them insure techs. And the insure techs can't understand why the big companies uh, aren't uh, doing risk mitigation. And they're still staying with just transfer of risk and leaving every home as exposed as it was, even though they know that for a, for a $200 device, I could lower your risk by $1,000. So <clears throat> the point here is for this to work is a system change. It's not just the, the prediction ability alone isn't enough. Here's one that may be the most controversial. <clears throat> Since I've been studying machine intelligence, I would say uh, very few people talked about this seven or eight years ago, and now it's the single most frequent question that I get, which is, uh, what about the risk of AI increasing, amplifying bias? And there's good reason for people's concern. There's all kinds of cases where AIs have not only learned human bias, but have then amplified it. Because AIs are optimizers. They're mathematical optimizers. So they take a thing and then, exp and then amplify it. At one point, Amazon created an AI to predict uh, who they should hire. And if you take all the Amazon hiring data, historically they had hired significantly, you know, conditional on people coming in for an interview, they had hired more, more men than women. And the AI, and they, they didn't they didn't necessarily uh, you know even uh, realize uh, that ratio. The AI certainly did. And the AI just figured uh, that men must be better than women. And so men would get penalized if they even had the word woman on their resume. If, for example, a man was a coach of a woman's soccer team, they would get dropped. That's how aggressive the AI became. <clears throat> okay, so obviously they quickly scrapped, the, they quickly scrapped that. Um, but here's the thing. This is, in my view, a serious problem, but it's a red herring. It's a red herring because where we see this ultimately going is that the people that are going to be the res to cause the resistance to the, the system level change that's going to come about by AI are not the social justice warriors that are, you know, uh, fighting because they think AI is going to amplify bias. It's going to be the opposite. 
When people figure out what AIs are able to do, it's going to be the people who benefit from discrimination. Because what I'm about to show you is, uh, will give you some instinct into why AIs are ultimately going to be the single most valuable tool for reducing discrimination and bias, in our view. Um, <clears throat> okay, so there's effectively, there's two steps to dealing with bias or discrimination. The first step is to, to identify it, and the second step is to fix it. In the, so in the first step, in finding it, uh, you know, there's, of course, many, many people that are doing research in this area. Uh, in my field, in economics, there's one that stands above all the rest. Uh, he's at the University of Chicago, and he has spent his career, way before this topic became fashionable, he uh, spent a career really uh, digging into this subject, uh, subject matter. And his point in the very beginning was, no two people are exactly alike. And that's why it's always so hard to prove discrimination. Because uh, people can always say, well, they're not exactly the same, and that's why we chose this person, or that's why we promoted that person, or whatever. No two people are exactly alike, unless, of course, they are. And so about 20 years ago, he did what's become a landmark study in economics, where he, he took a resume, the identical resume, and the only thing he changed was the name. And he had Lisa and Lakeisha, and, or Emily and Lakeisha, and Greg and Jamal. So identical resumes, identical schools they'd been to, identical grades, identical work experience, everything the same. The only thing different on the resumes was the names. And then he sent them out to uh, job ads in Chicago and Boston. And then he waited. He waited, and the entire study was about counting the callbacks. And Emily and Greg got 50% more callbacks. Everything else was the same. And so that was published in um, one of the top economics journals in, uh, called the American Economic Review <clears throat> and became uh, like the first in a series of studies. Okay, so that's what he did in 2004. Now, think about like, what that kind of research was like back then. That was, you know, you, you get all these uh, job postings, you make the resumes, you mail them out, and then you sit and wait by your fax machine, right? And then you wait for the faxes to come through for people to send in the stuff. Then, 15 years later, he did another, he did a, you know, a whole series of other studies that relate to this topic, but 15 years later, he did a very comparable one. But instead of detecting bias in hiring by human HR people, he did it with AIs. And the AIs were making predictions about, effectively, who should receive um, a certain kind of uh, health care. And what he found was the AIs were very biased. And then he dug into why and found it's because the AI had been trained to make predictions based on the costs that were being spent, healthcare costs, and that African Americans were in lower income districts that were where they were uh, less resources to pay for healthcare costs, and so it was effectively predicting that they needed less. So first of all, uh, he found that these, uh, this was another bias system, then found the problem, uh, and then was uh, able to address it. it. The study was published in Science. He looked at the two studies, and he made the point, both studies documented racial injustice. In the first, the applicant with a black-sounding name got fewer job interviews. In the second, the black patient received worse care. But they differed in one crucial respect. In the first... Hiring managers made biased decisions. In the second, the culprit was an AI. As the co-author of both studies, I see them as a lesson in contrast. Side by side, they show the stark differences between two types of bias, human and algorithmic. However, our 2004 resume study resembled a complex covert operation more than traditional academic research. We created a large bank of fictitious resumes and scraped uh, uh, help-wanted ads every day. Um, 
Uh, this went on for months, all before we had even one data point to analyze. Pinpointing discriminatory behavior by a particular group of people, hiring managers is often hard. By contrast, uncovering algorithmic discrimination was far more straightforward. This was a statistical exercise, the equivalent of asking the algorithm, what would you do with this patient? What would you do with this patient? What would you do with this patient? In other words, you can take the exact same thing and change one thing, one thing, one, and uh, even though people say AIs are black boxes, you, do, you can't s uh, sort of see how the neural net works. What you can do is scrutinize it. You can just ask it all these questions and it will always tell you the answer. So AIs are far more scrutable than humans. If you ask a human man hiring manager, say, hey, uh, would you hire this person if they were exactly the same as the person you just hired, except they, they were uh, from a, a minority group? Of course the hiring manager is going to say, yes, of course I would hire that person. There's no way to tell. But you can absolutely tell with an AI. Humans are inscrutable in a way that algorithms are not. Furthermore, with the resume study, fixing the problem has proved to be extremely difficult. For one, remember, when you detect bias in the, in this, well, the way that he did, it's at the aggregate level. There's no way to tell any, about whether any particular individual hiring manager is biased. Uh, furthermore, even if you were to tell someone was biased, there's no obvious way to fix it. Implicit bias training appears to have a modest impact at best. By contrast, we've already built a prototype that would fix the algorithmic bias we found, as did the manufacturer, who we concluded had no intention of producing bias results in the first place. Changing algorithms is easier than changing people, is the punchline. So in other words, it's easier to detect because you can scrutinize an AI in a way you cannot scrutinize a human, and then you can fix an AI in a way that you cannot fix a human. So now, who's going to want to stop the AIs? It's going to be the people who benefit from discrimination. And so as we move into system change, what we're interested in is where will the resistance come to? Like, why does that curve take so long for these AI systems to, uh, to be deployed? Because resistance from a number of, of areas. Here's my very last example. <clears throat> and it's just one picture. Who can guess uh, what these people are doing? Anybody? Uh, sort of. They are. They are. They are. They are. Uh, if you drive a, a taxi in the city of London. You go to school for three years to learn what's called the knowledge. And as you, you know, these are people that are at a school in West London learning the knowledge, uh, which is they study maps for a year, then they get on mopeds and they drive around the city of London for a year, and then they're basically doing maps and, and uh, driving, and then at the end of the third year they, they get their exam. Now, along come effectively two prediction tools. The first one is a navigational AI that you can be anywhere in the city of London and it predicts what's the most efficient route depending on the time of day and the traffic and so on to get to another spot. And everyone use, if you use Google Maps or Waze or whatever you use, that's what that is. The other is a prediction tool, an AI, that predicts the demand for rides in each neighborhood, which is what Lyft and Uber use in order to allocate uh, their cars. And so this has been a shift in power and a disruption. There's nothing that AIs did that made taxi drivers worse drivers. What they did was they decoupled prediction from judgment. Knowing the, knowing the predicting the best way to get from A to B, that's a prediction problem. And effectively, they gave everybody the equivalent of three years of going to school to learn the knowledge. So they didn't make taxi drivers worse, they made everyone else better. So without going to school for three years, we all now have an equivalent prediction capability uh, to those people. 
and that created a massive disruption. And despite, you know, there's a lot of criticism of how, um, you know, how aggressive uh, the CEO of Uber was, uh, the original CEO and, and so on, but what that person did, in my view, was he illustrated what it takes to do a system level change. And that system level change is coming. It is, in other words, he just pushed it through and you know railroaded over all kinds of things in order to get there. But Uber is the canary in the coal mine. It's what the world looks like uh, once the systems are redesigned to take advantage of prediction. And so it doesn't matter the industry, manufacturing, mining, drug discovery, uh, retail, all of these we are seeing just, we're starting to see just the, the, you know, the green, the early uh, steps of the transformation, but uh, it seems like it's on its way and this one uh, was, was the first. Okay, so that's it. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. We do have about 10 minutes for questions, and I would ask, please, perhaps we have a first wave of questions from people who are either students or can easily be mistaken for students. Um, and to keep this tight, put your question, keep it short. If, AJ, you could summarize the question, sure. that'll take care of the live stream. Okay. We won't have to pass the talking stick around. Okay. Please. Okay, so there's a lot in there. That, so there's a lot in that. So I'm going to propose that, that uh, we'll talk a afterwards. Uh, the question was re regarding uh, bias and, um, and bias in the input data for training the model and then bias in, I think, assessing the outcome of the model. Um, and so uh, the only point I'll, I'll um, make there, but I'll be happy to talk in detail about it afterwards, is that... Um, A way to, a way to, um, different systems have different ways of measuring or thinking of uh, assigning what we call ground truth. So, for example, if we are predicting whether a tumor is malign, uh, malignant or benign, uh, we can we make a prediction, and then later uh, we find out whether it's malignant or benign, and so that's ground truth. And now we can update our model, and ultimately. Um, increase the accuracy of, of the model. Some things uh, where we're making predictions and we never, you know, we, let's say it can be a, lot, uh, a long time between the time we make the prediction and the time that we find out the, the, the true outcome, uh, we're much more susceptible to those types of problems. So, it, but there's a fair amount of mechanics here, so let's, we'll talk after the session. Yes, please. Actually, do it, but right now we know that that's the foundation of epigenetics. Why 
Hispanic thing is like probably those data silos that are there that the vast majority of people do not comprehend. Do you think AI can actually be able to comprehend the total amount of information that is going to be eventually gathered as it, it becomes better at recognizing all these patterns? Well, I don't think AI, at least there's no progress at all yet on AI comprehending anything. So uh, the moment AI is simply computational statistics. And so uh, what it does have is an ability to ingest a vast amount of information. Uh, and, and so if you're, so I'm not sure if the emphasis of your question was on the, on the comprehension part or on the, uh, the magnitude of the input data side. Uh, but if it's on the latter, there's an, uh, an increasing amount of uh, investment in enhancing the amount of data that can be ingested and processed, both on the algorithmic side and on the hardware side. On the, on the comprehension part of your question, I would say there's been zero progress on that point. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I have a question. Um, thank you for this talk. It's, it's really interesting. I think um, I'm particularly interested in this sort of claim that, um, you know, sectors that have or show resistance to AI may have something to gain from discrimination. And I guess I'm wondering um, what you would say sort of to other kinds of resistance to adopting AI that don't have to do with discrimination. So, right, like one of them, at least as I have seen in the US is is sort of this threat of monopoly power that AI poses like you described or um, you know resistance to AI coming from sectors that are especially sensitive to sort of you know the destructive ways it's been um, adopted at least in in certain um, national economies right I'm thinking here of like yeah Google's got a great AI but like Sophia Noble's algorithms of oppression sort of um, yep. Stuff. So I guess I'm wondering what you think about other kinds of, of resistance to AI that don't have to do with the inherent capacity of it to sort of solve issues of individual discrimination. Sure. So, you know, I think AI, like any technology, um, it's agnostic to morals. Uh, I was very intrigued by Mark's introduction where he made the link to the School of Theology. Uh, because there is something, uh, you know, when I, that, I, that Cambridge Analytica was real. Uh, the people who have done the forensics on, on what happened, it, it's, it's not a conspiracy theory. Um, and so first of all, I think what's remarkable to me about AI in, in those types of applications is, is less about the AI and more about how easily manipulated we are. I, it's shocking how easily manipulated we are. Uh, how easily a prediction tool can influence what we read, what we listen to, um, who we communicate with. So that makes it very dangerous. Um, what I don't understand is there's a, there seems to be a, a, politic, a politicization of AI where certainly in this country, in the US and Western Europe, uh, everybody wants to keep AI out of the hands of the military. Meanwhile, other countries are investing very heavily in AI. It's so not obvious to me why we want the bad guys to, uh, to be so much further ahead. Another question, one of my co-authors was testifying before Congress <clears throat> just before the last election. And the Democrats uh, were very, you know, or have, a, have, a, have a strong leaning towards breaking up the large tech companies. Uh, and there's some, you know, reasonable arguments why that might benefit society. Uh, you know, companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon and Netflix, you could argue, are too big. Uh, you know, are, are they operating in the interests of, of uh, society uh, relative to what the world would look like if they were smaller and had more competitors? Um, and so the question was put to my co-author 
uh, what do you think? And he was there with four others. And the four others all agreed that uh, it would likely be in society's interest to break up uh, at least two of those companies. And my co-author said, well, I, we appreciate the, you know, the arguments for that. We have to remember that Google does search. Amazon does social network. Uh, pardon me, Facebook does social network. Amazon does retail. Netflix does movies. Tencent does all of those things. And so Tencent can train its AI using your chats with your friends and your searches to predict the things you're going to buy in a way that Amazon can't do. And so despite what you might be worried about with Facebook, Google, and Amazon, they could be our last line of defense. Um, so it's not obvious. Put it this way. I think in the very least, it's, it's not obvious. Uh, um, these things are, 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 are tricky. And I think my, my sort of high-level perspective on this is that um, people like, like Sharam Tafazli, who's here, uh, who's a Green College resident, builds AIs. And he has demonstrated the power, and he supplies AIs to the mining industry. People who work in this area have recognized how powerful it is. And I think uh, Haig has uh, used AIs uh, also in the mining industry for uh, exploration. Uh, people, I'm sure there are some here in the medical industry who have been amazed at, for example, AlphaFold and, and uh, you know, what, what uh, we've been able to achieve in a very short amount of time in protein folding that people have worked on for decades and haven't been able to solve. So it is, it is extremely powerful and it feels like that we've, this, we've been handed this powerful tool much faster than we figured out how to use it properly. And so um, I think the biggest lesson that we can learn is from examples like the Cambridge Analytica one, which is not how powerful the, the thing is, but how malleable we are and how easily we can be influenced um, is, is uh, in my view, the t sort of the takeaway message, uh, because this is like this is not a, you know, this is not a game. It's uh, it's being used at the highest levels. Uh, just earlier this month, two weeks ago, President Biden put together a a, a twenty seven person advisory committee, and you could if you read down the list, you can just see how political this has become, of who who's been appointed on that committee. Time for one more question. It could be anyone. It's Judy. Uh, this is slightly a comment, but when you first presented um, prediction versus judgment, I thought to myself, well, where's responsibility in this? And uh, yesterday, I listened to the BC CDC Grand Rounds, and the guy who was presenting basically said, we can predict who will die in the opioid crisis. So they have put together all the data for the last five years on who dies, and they can predict who's living down on the east side that will die. So then is it the system? Yeah, it's a system that has to go ahead and find those people before they die from opioid crisis. Yeah, it's a, it is a great point. You know, similarly, there was an announcement uh, maybe a week ago of a uh, new company that's being formed out of St. Michael's in Toronto, which is in the hospital system. They've been uh, experimenting with an AI to predict when patients uh, reach some sort of critical care need. And now the qu point, just like as you say, that prediction is useless unless you do something with it. And so, this, so you know, creating the system around uh, around the prediction is is uh, the whole premise of what this second second wave is. Is that I think. Um, we are just beginning to realize, like the redesign of the factory, that whether it's the hospital system, the school system, uh, the transportation system, all of these things, I think we've picked all the low-hanging fruit of all the, what I would call the point solutions, where you just get a prediction, the prediction leads to a simple action. Like Sharam's built a, a, a very 
a compelling tool where it predicts if a uh, the tooth on a digger in a mining uh, operation if the t if the tooth is broken he's got a thing that a camera that looks at it and and predicts whether that thing is broken or not and if it is they go and fix the tooth that's a point solution it's a prediction it leads to a specific action and it doesn't impact anything else nothing else in the mine operation is impacted by that but it's when you start for example building a fully autonomous mine where one prediction one decision impacts all many other decisions and now from an economics perspective we're into the realm of game theory where we're impact you know if, if we change this decision how does that impact all these other decisions and that is the system level design quick, quick question from a from a green college resident member who i think is up in the great hall watching the live stream how will ai affect academia and what would your advice be to up and coming academics in this regard <laughs> All right, so I guess two things, and then I get, and this is it. This, so I know everybody's hot and tired and ready to stretch their legs. Two things. The first thing is, um, it is, I think, going to become, if someone were to ask me where do I think the biggest impact from AI would be, I think it's going to be in research, in innovation. Uh, one of my advisors, who's, uh, his name is V. Grillikis, he's an economist at Harvard, um, he advocated for this idea of inventions in methods of inventing. And in other words, a tool that can lead to inventions of many other things. Uh, like, th like the lens. The lens allowed, you know, grinding lenses, that technology allowed us to see, but it also enabled the microscope and the telescope. And both of those things created an enormous set of innovations uh, because of an of a change in the method for invention. And so with AI in academe as a tool, uh, whether it's in physics or in uh, uh, medicine, uh, or and I've seen it in literature and in, in history and in archeology, span all kinds of fields, people are starting to use this as a uh, extremely powerful tool that is multimodal. So in other words, normally we do statistics and we're used to doing statistics where we, the only time we, we can really do statistical work is when we've got numbers in a spreadsheet. Whereas now we can take in pictures and videos and audio and, and use all kinds of different modes of data in order to do analysis. So that would be one. The second thing, uh, which will be my sort of uh, ode to Green College, is that what this does in, when it's uh, deployed in a social sense, let's take the, like, the, an extreme sense like Facebook, is it, it draws... It helps us, you know, if you like this, then you will like this. And it creates narrower and narrower communities. And so in terms of the things people read in the news and the communities that they join online, the AIs get smarter and they start pairing people who are more and more alike. Which in my view, the greatest antidote to what AI is doing to society is Green College. Because Green College uh, is precisely the opposite of, it's by design, bringing people from different disciplines and different groups into um, you know, uh, living together and, and cross-pollinating ideas. Uh, so the university needs it, but I think more than ever with AI, we need more green colleges. Well, green, green College, a different kind of machine, and part of the machine here has to do with the receptions we always have afterwards, so you're all invited to that. Those of you who have also had an invitation to dinner for tonight know who you are, and you're expected at the University Center promptly by 7 o'clock. I'm not going to have the last word, though, right now, because that's going to go to AJ's old roommate, uh, the brilliant engineer and entrepreneur, Sharam Tafazoli. Thank you very much. Uh, hi everyone, so I'm Shaharm, um, former roommate of Wing Poon, AJ Agrawal, college mate of Joanne, advice, lots, lots, got lots of advice from Haig Forrest, uh, the father of venture capital in Vancouver, good friend of John Higgins. So 
a little bit just quick story because I know you guys are, uh, I mean, first of all, very engaging talk. I, I tell you, I've been to many talks by AJ and every time is refreshing. Today I wasn't sure if I'm coming or not. I, I know what AJ is going to talk about, prediction machines. So in the last couple of years, he has written a new book and pretty much everything was fresh for me. So I really enjoyed that. Thanks a lot. Um, August 1992. Just imagine me, right? No gray hair, no belly. 25-year-old from Iran. I come to Vancouver. I went to Sharif University, good university. Learned a lot. I was coming here to do my PhD, and I was like, wow, I love this city. Look at this. This is amazing. First year, off-campus living, I was bored. Because I used to party a lot in Iran with friends, music, and everybody just... They have they're Walkman and running. I'm like, how do you have fun like that? <laughs> so, get to know Mr. Wing and learn about Green College. And I apply. And I put a note that both I'm, uh, we are from ethnic countries and we want to cook. Give us a kitchen. So, we get that uh, unit up there, 1993. Shortly after, one day, I'm uh, in that. In the kitchenette area, you don't have to study. There's a head comes in and says, I hear you guys have good food here. And that was AJ. <laughs> <laughs> so we become really good friends. And uh, I learned I was doing engineering, electrical engineering. And he was doing PhD in uh, business in uh, UBC. And he went to MIT for one year. And he was researching how patent makes its way commercially to industry and people make money and stuff like that. So very interesting and very complimentary. And back then I started, um, market for jobs were quite bad. I finished my PhD and ended up starting a company uh, very slowly. And uh, AJ provided really good advice. And a lot of it was because he was also a TA in Hague Forest School and uh, class. And he had learned tons of stuff from him on innovation, on technology, how to bring it into market. So he, he became an advisor in my company over the years, very part-time. But what is relevant here is two things. I'll just say that, and I know you guys want to get going. One was in 2014, shortly after he had, with a lot of controversy, started Creative Destruction Lab out of University of Toronto, Rotman School of Business, with pretty much no funding and trying to get a concept off the ground um, to advise startups and essentially what he calls, I love the way he describes it. You know, he talks about judgment, he applies it everywhere. He called it, this is a university-based marketplace for judgment. What it means is that I bring professors, MBA students, former successful entrepreneurs, uh, and all those kind of people under one roof. And as a founder of a venture, and maybe some are here from Green College that in future will do, will provide you this market. So you have an idea, we tell you what we think. You can hear. We tell you how to prioritize and all that. And that was the concept he had started. And you know, 2012, I believe, uh, out of University of Toronto. And he, in 2014, he, you know, he would spend one day, he was a super busy guy, uh, in Vancouver, give advice, but in a very relaxed environment, he said, Shahram, consider deep learning in what you are doing in mining. Essentially, we were processing images and videos, and he said, consider AI. And I gotta say, being an engineer, being a bright engineer from fancy school with very high marks, I wasn't considering that. Because, you know, once you are in the forest, you, you see trees, you don't see the forest, right? So, <laughs> I'm like, okay. We had a tough problem, hired a consultant. Within a year, three different teams working on the same problem. Uh, within the six months, AI hands down beat everything. And I was like, OK, aha moment. First of all, thanks a lot, AJ. Send me the invoice, send you the check. And then, <laughs> and then to the team, I said, our company, we are going to be AI based, everything based on AI. So really good judgment received from there, and uh, it helped the company grow and get on international stage uh, a lot of attention. But what I want to say, what you didn't hear today, you heard about his work on prediction machines and AI.
but that Creative Destruction Lab, which started very, um, very modestly, very similar to how I started my company, really, uh, with, with credit card debt, to be honest. And uh, I think similar situation, I, I'm guessing. Um, it's now international, had, has several cities in Canada and international locations in the US, in, in Paris, in Estonia, in uh, England, I believe. Um, uh, creative destruction, many tracks. So literally, I think it's probably hundreds or thousands of successful ventures coming out of it, going through the filter of that market for judgment, simple idea that has been evolved, and is really the result of the hard work in the presence of all that uh, challenges of AJ and his team has grown. I think the organization is 150 people, but there's lots of things are coming. There's a lot of value created to, for Canada as the birthplace of this. So um, very proud of the you know, recommendation you had for my company, uh, which helped uh, it grow and uh, become differentiated, and also what you are doing for Canada for uh, via Creative Destruction Lab. So I wanted to just have a you know introduction to that. So thank you very much. Thank you.